This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Trinity Hospers. Uh, my name is Kurt Bush. I'm the campus pastor um, here at Trinity Hospers, and I'm just really glad to be able to be with you, even on camera today. Um, I, I know in some of these kind of weird times where we can't be together physically that, that I'm really grateful um, for this sort of technology that we can still connect and we can still open the word together even if uh, through electronic means. So I'm really grateful to be able to do that with you today. So I, I want to start, I want to ask you a question. H have you ever seen a child or had a child that you've kind of helped learn how to speak? Um, I, I think of, you know, toddlers that are learning how to use words or learning how to say words or learning how to build them into conversation. And, and I think that's one of my favorite memories of raising my kids. And they're older now. My kids are, are still learning how to engage in dialogue, but they're not saying all those funny words that, that, we, that we know toddlers to say. But I look back on those and I, I have really fond memories. And I'm reminded that in those moments, that that sort of building language and learning how to use words is something that takes work on the child's part and it's something that takes work on the, the parent's part or the, the adult that's pouring into them as they're learning how to speak, right? That the, the kids have to exercise what they're trying to do and the parents are trying to um, teach. And I want to give you an example. My, my son, um, for the longest time, couldn't say the word milk. The word milk was just out of his vocabulary. It would come out nulk, N-U-L-K, for the longest time. He would try and try and try, and my wife and I would try and try and try to get in. We do all the things that, that parents do, right? You get down on your hands and knees and you like milk. You give the hard enunciation, try to get him to say milk. The babysitter tried and we tried, it felt like forever, and it just wouldn't work. The kid loved milk, he was always asking for it, but he couldn't say the word. Until one day, he just says milk. Just out of nowhere, he says milk. And this felt like something. This felt like progress, it felt like growth, and, and just as an update, he's 10 and he still is able to say the word milk appropriately. So, good update. But I think we get things like this. I think we understand that there's times in life, and even times in our spiritual life, that uh, things take work on our part, that, that we're uh, playing a role, we're participating in things, and others are participating in things in, in working in us as well. Just like our son as a toddler would try his hardest to say the word milk, so would we pour into him to try to teach him. I think our discipleship is similar, and, and, and while the milk analogy isn't perfect and it breaks down somewhere along the line, I'll let you figure out where that analogy breaks down, but I think our spiritual life and our growth as disciples is similar that it requires participation on our part and it requires participation on God's part through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're gonna see what this passage in Philippians has to say about that today and how that might help us grow with joy. But I think it's worth noting too, this passage kind of starts out interestingly. Uh, Paul writes that he's, he's not obtained um, something yet, he's not uh, claiming that he's owned something or, or achieved something. Um, he's not clung that he's reached his goal, but there is one thing that he says he does claim. There's one thing that he says he does kind of own as having responsibility for and having a, a role in, and it's this in verse 13. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul does own some of that. Paul takes on some of that um, and takes on some responsibility on, on pressing toward the goal. And remember what the goal is. A, a couple weeks ago, we looked at um, a, a, a section of this chapter just ahead of this when Paul calls all of his gains loss and uh, the, the achievements that he had held on to were, were rubbish compared to knowing Christ. That's the goal. Remember that that's the goal that Paul's striving towards here. Verse 10, just to remind all of us, verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. That's the goal. That's the goal that Paul is forgetting what lies behind in order to, to look 
ahead and to strive towards that goal. I think Paul talks here and uh, shows that that growth happens, that striving towards the goal, that pressing onward happens both by our participation and by God's action. So those two aspects we're going to look at, our personal responsibility, our personal role, our commitment to growth, and God's uh, commitment to our growth as well. So I, I do think here in this passage, Paul does make a, a pretty clear case for our participation. And he does that by communicating um, in a language that's kind of widely thought reflects uh, a runner. Um, Paul is, is thought to be taking a posture here that, that's similar to a runner running a race. That Paul's mentality is, is that he is uh, running towards this goal. And that posture of Paul being a runner is, is interesting. And I think it means a couple things for us. If, if we're to kind of assume this same um, analogy as, as us being a runner in a race going towards a goal, I think it means a couple things. I think the first thing it means is that um, it, a successful runner, a runner that's, that's going to succeed in what they've trained for, they, they look ahead. A, a good runner doesn't spend a, a ton of time looking behind them at the other runners because that only serves to distract them, right? A good runner is, is envisioning what's ahead, envisioning the finish line, envisioning what's between them and the finish line and what's needed to get to that finish line. Again, to look behind only serves to distract from the goal. So I wonder then what that means for our personal growth, what that means for our life as a, a runner running towards this finish line of knowing Christ. I think maybe a couple ways. I think first there's this idea that what's behind us is behind us. Because remember again Paul's words um, about the gains being counted as loss. Th those things that had, had identified him, had brought him pride. Those things that he hung his hat on, if you will. Those things were lost. Those were behind him. It allowed him to look ahead. And I think the same can be said for uh, things that bring us guilt or things that um, might make us feel shame. I think this passage speaks to those two to say that all of those things are behind us so that we can look ahead to the goal of knowing Christ. Because the, the reality, the truth is that just like Paul had been found by Christ, we too have been found by Christ. And as our identity gets wrapped up in who Jesus is by, by what the Spirit does in us to unify us with Christ. As that becomes real in our lives, the, the reality is those things behind us can stay behind us. Jesus gets rid of the guilt. Jesus quiets the voices of shame. Jesus gives us a, a, a new thing to boast in and what he has done for us. We can leave those behind in order to look ahead. And remember that that means for us, just like it did with Paul, right? We know from previous weeks that Paul didn't allow those things to define him. While they once defined him, they don't anymore. The same is true for no matter what is behind us, those things don't have to define us anymore. Our identity in Christ defines us so we can let those things be behind us. Jesus allows those things to stay behind us and not allow them to take our eyes off the goal of knowing Christ. It allows us to be more present to what lies ahead. Now, the other thing that I think is worth uh, mentioning here is Paul's posture and Paul's words. Because if you remember, the, the, the letter here to the church in Philippi is partly about addressing the Judaizers, the Jewish Christians that have been speaking um, into the church in Philippi to say, you have to do, you have to do, you have to do. Your, your faith in Jesus as Savior is not enough. You have to be circumcised. You have to observe rituals. You have to eat the right things. You have to do. That's sometimes confused with Paul's words because sometimes we hear Paul's words of saying, I'm pressing forward, and sometimes we get confused and think, well, the Judaizers were asking the church to do. Isn't Paul asking the same thing that we do, that our participation is similar? And... and I'm going to say no. There's one important distinction here. The Judaizers were encouraging the church in Philippi that they had to do more to be seen as righteous in the eyes of God. 
that their actions, their participations were to earn righteousness, were to, to seal in the eyes of the Lord how they were seen. But Paul says this. This is the important difference. Paul says that's not the case. Paul says Jesus has already done that. We know from Scripture that Jesus makes us right in the eyes of the Lord. All that Jesus has done and is doing in us makes us right in the eyes of the Lord. Nothing that we can do. So the difference is that Paul's, um, Paul's, advoca- Paul's advocating for participation here out of a response. Paul's participation is a response to grace. A response to what Jesus has done for him. A, a response to being able to leave those things that previously defined him in the past so he could press on towards the goal of knowing Christ. The same is true for us. We, we don't participate to earn. We don't participate to, to be righteous. We don't participate so that God sees us with favor. We participate in our growth as a response to grace, a, a response to the, the redeeming work that Jesus has done uh, for us and continues to, to work by the Spirit in us. So we can be confident. We can remember that just like Paul did, None, none of our participation is for merit. None of this is about earning. And trust in God's grace for Paul didn't make Paul less active. It didn't make Paul less of a participant in his growth. It didn't make him passive. It didn't make him less active than the Judaizers. But that difference is that it's a response. We don't do because it gets us merit. We don't participate because it earns us anything. We participate because Jesus makes us right in the eyes of the Lord, and we're, we're free then in our true selves to participate in our growth. We have a role, and God acts in us. And, and that's the second part, God's action, right? If the goal is to know Christ, we just, we just can't do that on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to work in us. And this process then of the Holy Spirit working in us, we, we call sanctification, we call this the, the Holy Spirit's action in transforming us and transforming the parts of us that, that don't always necessarily reflect the image of God and don't necessarily always reflect God's purpose for us or his purpose for his creation. So the Spirit's doing that work and doing that work in, in places in us and parts of us that we don't even know need the work. And I, I think that's the beauty of this and that's the importance of this is that There's just not enough personal responsibility or personal effort or commitment or anything for us to change those parts of us that we don't even know aren't in line with God. Martin Luther, who was a Protestant reformer, wrote this about sanctification, about God's work in us. Way back in the 1500s, he said this, This life is not godliness, but growth in godliness. Not health, but healing." Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it has begun. This is not the goal, but it is the road. At present, all does not gleam and glitter, but everything is being purified. It's beautiful, right? This idea that that, that we are being sanctified, we are being worked on, that while we are participating and while we contribute to our growth, so is God along the way. I, I want to go back to the milk example from earlier. Right? We worked really hard with our son to, to get him to say milk, and he worked really hard to say milk. And it felt, again, it felt like a win. It felt like something. After all of that work, it felt like progress toward the goal. Because the, the goal is that, that our son at some point can be, um, can be in conversation with people and can use words in the right context and, and kind of use the English language to his, to his advantage, right? That, that's kind of our goal in teaching our kids how to talk. But he was still three. He was not a master conversationalist. He was not super excellent in all parts of dialogue. He, he could say the word milk, but he was still three. But it felt like something, and there was way more ahead. He got to use this new word, milk, in the right way, in the right context. He got to use that, 
and he was still growing. And I think there's something there for us as we grow and know Christ. As the Holy Spirit unifies us with Christ, as the Holy Spirit grows us, we, we too get to enjoy what's happening in us along the way. We don't have to wait until we're perfect whatever because we never will be, right? The idea with our son is that we don't expect kids to wake up one day never speaking any words and then just one day being expert conversationalists and now they get to use what they've learned. No, they use it all along the way. I think the same is true for us. Even though we don't fully know Christ, even though the goal is to know Christ more, we, we can experience Christ in new and fresh ways every day. We can experience things like peace and rest and joy and hope and belonging right now. Even though we don't fully know those things, we can still know them right now. We don't have to wait until the end. right? I think this is the, one of the myths that, that the Christian life gets, gets reduced down to believing in Jesus as our Savior. And then we just kind of wait out our time here until we can finally realize hope and joy and peace and rest. But I don't think that's what Paul's teaching. I think Paul's teaching that we can experience those things not fully and completely because the kingdom hasn't come fully and completely, but in part, we can experience those things even today. That's my prayer for us today, that that all of us, even today as we're meeting electronically and and connecting electronically and and we long to be in physical, physical space together, I long that we would find ways to to press on, to not look back, to not have to worry about watching our feet as we run. I pray that we might see areas that that maybe we can take the next step in our, our growth and take the next step of our responsibility and our participation in our growth. I wonder if maybe this time... For, for some of us kind of being in this quarantine phase where we're in our homes together, maybe now more than we have been in a long time, I wonder if there's an opportunity here um, kind of kind of waiting for us under the surface that, that maybe we can draw closer to God. Maybe we can take that next step of our participation and our growth. So for whatever that looks like for you, I just I pray that we lean into that together. I also pray that, that that we allow God to show us where he's working in us. I believe really strongly that the Holy Spirit's working in each one of us. As, as he unifies us with Christ, he's shaping us. I pray that God shows us the places where we're being shaped so that we may partner then with the Holy Spirit in our growth. I pray most of all that God continues that work in each one of us and that we can see that work and we can celebrate that work together. And I pray mostly that as we lean into our participation and lean into our personal responsibility to grow in Christ, I pray that day by day, we're drawn closer to Jesus, the living Jesus, the the living Jesus that reigns right now, the living Jesus that promises to set everything right, everything right. The same living Jesus that that sets all of our kings and kingdoms and ideas and concepts and thoughts about what life looks like, sets all of those on its head for the sake of being citizens in his kingdom. I pray deeply that we're drawn closer and closer to, to that Jesus and that we may grow with joy. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the means that that we can do this and connect electronically and and open up your word together, even though we're not in the same space, that that we know that your Holy Spirit works anytime we open your word and, and dive into it together. God, we pray that you show in us the, the places that you're working in us, the places that you are sanctifying us and and shaping our hearts to be more in line with your heart. May we see those and be open to those. And may we partner with you in growing those areas. God, we want to know you more. We want to know Jesus more 
Um, we, we want to be filled with joy and peace and hope and rest just a little bit more each day. God, may you do that in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen.